I was a climatologist working in the North Pole for the last four years, and I quit last week. I just returned to my childhood home in Owatonna, Minnesota, where I've moved back into my house. You see, proving global warming was real was my life's passion. I'm only 32 years old, but I spent 12 years studying patterns of climate and their effect on the ozone, fighting deniers at every turn. I wanted to be the one to change their minds and get everyone to give a damn about the Earth. I didn't find what I was looking for in the North Pole. I found something much worse. I'm posting this here as a warning of what's to come if we don't change things. My crew consisted of six people, myself included. We lived on an arctic barge, designed to house us while we studied various melting glaciers. The captain was known to us as Captain Patches Stacy of the St. Lucian research boat in the North Pole. His second in command was a girl I was sweet on, only 27 years old, and on her way to being a ship captain by 30 years old, skilled enough to traverse the frigid waters of the Arctic. Her name was Stormy, and like the sea she fared, she was volatile and fierce. Her hair was always in a tight strawberry blonde bun, and her eyes carried the blue depth of the ocean that swore to change at every passing wave. Stormy and I had a budding love, running deep after being together on the St. Lucian for four years, only leaving each other's side for the short stints of shore leave, which, in the later years, was also spent together. Stormy had no family, so for holiday shore leave, she'd return to Minnesota with me and spend the holiday with my large Midwestern family. It was like she was meant to be there. Along with us was another climatologist named Craig, who was 30 years older than me, and somewhat of a mentor. He was the true brains of the operation, and inspired me every day to continue our journey of learning. Tall, thin and grey, Craig would skulk around the deck in his signature yellow parka, theorising loudly about the things below the water's surface. We had an intern, a young native Inuit girl, who was about to graduate with her own degree in climatology. Her name was Yuka, and she's the bright star that kept those trips fun and positive. Watching her bloom into a genius and game-changer was truly beautiful. The final member of our team was an aged crew hand, who served as our cook and boatkeeper, named Hank, and much like Patches, he was about as old as these glaciers. Hank was kind, though, through and through. He accidentally bulk-ordered us girls just about a shipping container's worth of feminine products because he wasn't sure how many we needed. Is 100 a week for you responsible? I can get more, I remember him saying, wholesome and kind in his concern. Their faces will live in my mind's eye until I draw my last breath on this earth that I so love. The last Saturday of April 2020 was the end of the life I shared with these people. We were running on sonar and a deep water exploration submersible drone we'd nicknamed Floody Mary, down to map the size of a submerged iceberg that appeared to be melting at an alarming rate. Luckily, no wildlife at all would come near this iceberg, and I can't help but feel like that's because they knew what was inside. Patches and Hank sat in their HQ, watching over us while Stormy helped me man the drone and the sonar. We sat leg to leg, excited and eager watching the exploration unfold before us. That's when we heard the blip. The sonar Stormy operated shook as it transmitted a deep call, lower and louder than any whale we'd picked up on in the past. What was that? I said, looking at Stormy. Probably a whale, V. Nothing to stress about, Stormy said with a smile. Maybe it's some kind of geological activity. Craig said, putting a hand on the sonar equipment. I read online about noises coming from the Arctic like here. There's like a whole conspiracy theory. I really didn't think it was real, Yuka said, leaning over and looking at the screen depicting Floody Mary's footage 
showing a whole lot of iceberg, and not much else. That's when the second blip came. This time, so loud, we didn't need the sonar to hear it. The boat rocked and creaked as the sound pushed it to its limits. What was that? I said, holding onto my equipment for dear life. I don't know, but from the sounds of it, it must be massive. Stormy, pull up the equipment, let's move, Craig said. He turned to Yuka. Yuka, I don't know what this thing is, but I want you to get to the communication centre and be ready to radio for help. Then Craig finally settled on me. Watch the screen with me. Let's try and figure out what that noise is. I nodded and watched the drone's footage as Stormy guided it along the side of the iceberg and up to the boat. That's when I saw something in the iceberg move. Sluggish and slow, as the next bloop came, loud and languorous, the boat nearly capsized. My body was thrown with crakes to the other side of the deck. A loud crack signalled something breaking off from the iceberg. When the boat settled, I could hear the screams of Stormy Craig and Captain Patches. I dared a look at the iceberg to see the creature that had been making the noises that was so monstrous as to nearly destroy our vessel was partially thawed out of his icy cage. The creature was enormous, as the iceberg was the size of a skyscraper in that cold blue water. It was black like a midnight sky, contrasting the white ice around it. Snow was falling from the sky and forming little constellations on the creature's void-coloured skin. It had one big yellow blinking eye and more mouths than I could count, even in what was exposed. Each one had different kinds of teeth. Some were dull like human teeth, and some were sharp like that of a lion. How is it alive? I screamed to Craig, who was transfixed on the creature. Craig looked at me and let out a horrified scream, covering his eyes with his hands. It's horrible! It's horrible! God, make it stop! He screamed. Then I heard Yuka over my walkie-talkie. I see what's happening. Get Stormy and come to the bridge. Patches and Hank are dead. Over. I looked around to see Yuka standing in the control tower and Captain Patches dead in his chair behind her and Hank with a bloodied head against the glass. My eyes darted around for Stormy. I saw her at the edge of the deck, reaching out to the creature. I ran over to her and grabbed her by the waist and dragged her to the control tower. No! The old one needs me! Stormy screamed, viciously thrashing about. Luckily, I am a stout woman and I held her firm. As I approached the doorway leading to the entrance of the control tower, I saw Craig throw himself overboard. I winced and managed to open the door and get Stormy and I inside. As soon as her eyes left the creature, she relaxed and folded into me. She began to sob and I squeezed her tight shushing her gently. Yuka is alive. Can you please get us out of here? Stormy nodded, then spoke. I just can't see that thing. I need to blind myself. Just activate autopilot to the nearest port, I said, prompting a nod from Stormy. I looked around the staircase and found one of the emergency kits and grabbed it from the wall as Stormy and I raced to the control room. Yuka snapped her head to us as we entered and I could see she'd been sobbing. I'm so glad you two are safe. I just watched Craig kill himself too, she said in a shaky voice. I looked at Patches and Hank. Patches had a forty-four magnum in his hand. He had killed Hank, then himself, when he saw this terror. I opened my kit, pulled out a flare gun, went to the crank window on the side of the control, and fired it high into the sky. As I did so, Yuka radioed for help, but quickly said, Comms are down! Everything is down! Stormy made herself busy, trying to start autopilot and avoiding looking at the creature. It let out a final bloop that caused everything in the control centre to thrash around the small room, throwing us all off of our feet. I wound up screaming for help underneath a very dead Captain Patch's Stacy. When we resumed our stations, Stormy spoke. Autopilot is 862! 
I'm going to have to do this on my own, she said with a firm, determined voice. I wobbled over to Stormy and put a hand on either shoulder, holding her in place. You can do this. Get us out of here. You are the best navigator I've ever seen, Captain Stormy. Get us to the nearest harbour. Don't look at it, I said, doing my best to resolve her. Dutch harbour, Dutch harbour, Dutch harbour, Stormy repeated to herself over and over again, as she guided us past the creature and to safety. Yuka operated a mapping system the whole way back, and I took the bodies of Hank and Patches to the hull. We all stayed together in control, sleeping there, eating cold meals there, too afraid to leave. Even when the water was calm, it seemed like we'd hear a bloop out of nowhere at any time. Stormy and Yuka got us to safety. All of our equipment was lost, and all of my research was for nothing, especially with Craig gone. Stormy and Luca lied, and told the Navy officers that intercepted us that Captain Patches Stacy had snapped, killing Hank and throwing Craig and the equipment overboard. I simply followed along. Stormy walked away with some kind of maritime medal for her brave actions, and Yuka returned to her home in Vancouver, where she swore she'd resume her studies and dedicate her findings to Craig. We spoke this morning. I am shell-shocked, living in my childhood home with my loving parents doting on me at every beck and call. I see those mouths every time I close my eyes, and I see Craig jumping to his watery grave. Stormy is finishing her affairs and coming here to me tomorrow. We will start our lives together as two people who have lived through something terrible but came out alive together. Stormy said we can live far away from the cold and the water. She swore she'd take me to Albuquerque, where we can live out our days, far away from the Arctic melting glaciers. So here it is. My plea. Please give a damn about global warming. Because there are terrors in those icebergs. Things that will consume mankind. And if we don't stop global warming, they'll be free in no time.